Hello, my name is Brian Berry and this is The Power of One. We live in a time when our idea of community is frayed, strained due to our busy lives, challenged by the political landscape and competing responsibilities. Some of us believe that getting involved will not change anything, that being civically involved will just lead to defeat and frustration. But what does it mean to feel empowered enough to take action on an issue of concern, to get involved in a cause that is bigger than ourselves? Fortunately, however, there are many people in our community who are doing something about the conditions in which we live. They are creative and dynamic individuals who are fighting for what is right and what is better for the lives of everyone. This program will show you that one person can make a difference and that the power of one is within all of us. Welcome to the power of one. Today my guest is Peter Kalmus. He's an earth scientist at JPL. Uh, the opinions he expresses today will be his own. Um, and he's also the author of an upcoming book, which uh, we're going to talk about a little bit and is pretty exciting. It's called Being the Change, Live Well, and Spark a Climate Revolution. And it'll be published by New Society this summer. In addition, um, he was published in this edition of uh, Yes Magazine, which is a pretty great magazine because it focuses on positive um, conditions and then changes. Um, as opposed to just talking about the negative. So thank you for being here today, Peter. Well, thanks for having me, Brian. So it's the, good to be here. The first, the first question I had, I mean, you know, science covers a lot of ground, and there's everything from astrophysicists to geologists, but what's an earth scientist? Right, so my actual official title is data scientist, and I work a lot with satellite data and other kinds of data, and um, you know, there's, a, there's a million kinds of data. We get, you know, remote sensing data from different kinds of satellites. We can sense the ocean. We can sense the biosphere, you know, forests. Um, we can sense the atmosphere, the temperature, and the water vapor profiles. I do a lot of that with infrared sensors. Um, uh, an Earth scientist is someone who studies some part of the Earth system. I think it's just a, a general definition. Um, so, you know, an astrophysicist looking at stars outside of the Earth wouldn't be an Earth scientist, but yeah. someone studying the oceans or the ice sheets or even like a forest ecosystem those would all be Earth scientists. Oh, so now I get the connection. All of those are impacted by the atmosphere or by the climate. Well, the Earth and system, so. you can think of the Earth as a giant system, you know, that, that, can, it, that consists of the atmosphere and the oceans and how they interact mm -hmm. and how the atmosphere interacts with the land and the different uh, parts of the biosphere, the different ecosystems on the land, how the, the ice interacts with that, how the, the rock system and the interior of the Earth interacts with. This is all the Earth system. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a wonder, it's like a spaceship in space, right? And it's, it's, it gives us life support, it gives us clean water, yeah. clean air. Um, it created us. I mean, we're literally the children of it because, you know, billions of years of evolution created our DNA, which eventually, you know, yeah. for, you know from bacteria to, to, to different other species eventually gave rise, rise to humans. So this is, the Earth system is this amazing, um, spaceship that allows, literally allows us to be here and have this conversation. Yeah, and it's extremely fragile too, so. Right, and I think, you know, for the vast humans have been around for maybe around 100,000 years or so, and until very recently, we assumed that, you know, we just took it for granted. And yeah. now there's seven and a half billion humans on this planet, and we're, who knows how many internal combustion engines are running right at this moment. And um, so it's like, a, you know, we've taken most of the habitat over. Um, wild animals are in precipitous decline right now because yep. there's just so many humans taking up the space and basically eating most of the primary productivity, most of the, you know, the matter that the, the most of the food that the planet is creating is getting turned into human right now. Um, and then on top of that, we're changing the composition of the atmosphere with our um, with burning fossil fuels. Yeah. So, so now it's really clear that we have a profound effect on the spaceship, but we've only realized that really maybe within the last century or so. Yeah, so I wanna talk a little bit about climate deniers or, or climate change deniers or just people who are not willing to understand what you just described. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about scientists in and of themselves because mm -hmm. I thought your article in Yes Magazine was really revealing. And you mentioned the fact that scientists um, naturally are shy, introverted, introspective, um, and not really willing to take a lot of risks. What are some of the challenges for someone yeah. like yourself 
to be <laughs> to be saying to going against the grain and saying you know we're right. in trouble. So the the title of the article or the headline of the article was um, what was it? It's a message to my fellow climate scientists: yeah. be brave, be human, and speak truth. Um, so scientists are we're comfortable doing science. I think you know a good number of us were sort of the, you know, the shy, studious types when we were kids. Yeah. We love being in laboratories. We love looking at data. We love figuring things out. We're not necessarily that good at communicating and speaking publicly. Yeah. Um, so this would be an example of, of what I consider speaking out and, and speaking to the public. And you know, it's important to try to explain things without using the jargon of science, which is almost like its own separate language. Yeah. Um, and you know, scientists spend decades learning that language. It's, you know, if, if, if I started speaking a foreign language, um, like German or French to your audience, like you, I wouldn't expect an English speaking audience to understand that. And it's sort of the same thing with science. You know, you use all this jargon that scientists are specially trained in. And it's a very precise language, which is important because we're trying to express really precise things. Yeah. But speaking to the, the public is another matter. You have to be, be sort of a good communicator just at that level. But then, um, you know, global warming has gotten so politicized, which is really unfortunate because, you know, basically we, we're changing the composition of the atmosphere. We put these molecules in the atmosphere that when infrared photons coming from the surface of the earth hit these greenhouse gas molecules, they get blocked. And then those molecules heat up and, and emit some infrared radiation back down to the earth. So it's warming the planet. Well, those photons and those gas molecules, they don't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, or what laws we pass, yeah. they're just going to, you know, trap more infrared radiation and make the planet get warmer. Uh, it doesn't matter to them what humans are discussing mm -hmm. and, and talking about. So it's really unfortunate that this got so politicized. But because it has gotten politicized, you know, there's a lot of people out there who don't want to see any action happen on climate change. Uh, some of these people may have a vested interest. They might be associated with fossil fuel companies. So they want to make more profits by selling all of that. Yeah. You know, maybe some people are just afraid of global warming and it's too frightening. And so they want to pretend that it's not happening. I'm not really sure what motivates deniers, but they exist and they, they would prefer, you know, scientists not spread the message that this is a really serious, really urgent problem that needs immediate action by humanity. Yeah, and we're going to talk about some examples in a few minutes, but um, so there are pressures on scientists not to speak out. So is this kind of like I feel a, pressure, yeah, not to speak um, out. A Galileo sort of a moment where <laughs> it's funny that you say that because the deniers often try to uh, pretend that they're like Galileo and that they're standing up against and, and that like the scientists or the church or something and they're the ones taking this brave stand, which is utterly ridiculous because isn't that kind of backwards? Totally backwards. Galileo was doing science. He had evidence. He took actual measurements. Yeah. And then he was saying, that stuff that you just basically made up, well, the measurements I took are saying that that's not true. And the, these deniers are saying exactly the opposite thing. We have scientists over several decades, over actually 150 years, we've known about the greenhouse yeah. gas mechanism, how, how, how the planet would heat up if we release carbon dioxide. We've known that for a long time. We have an incredible mountain of evidence that supports this. It's totally consistent. Um, you can't, we, we have no idea how we could create this kind of a warming on the planet without the greenhouse gases that we've emitted. So, yeah. so there's a mountain of evidence supporting this, what, that this is happening. Then you have these people over here just for whatever reason saying, no, that's wrong. You know? And they're not providing any evidence whatsoever. So they're not doing science. Yeah, it's more whoever has the loudest voice or have, whoever yes. has the airwaves. Yeah, and, and, and these deniers, they're, they're often professional communicators. And so, you know, scientists like me who are, you know, we're not, we're not trained. We don't have necessarily the personality to speak out. We like doing science. So it's, you know, I got asked to do um, a quote unquote debate with a denier really? once at, at some event. And I turned it down. I said, there, there is no, that would be dishonest and it would be doing oh. a disservice to the discourse because there is no debate. You know, it's settled. Like oh. if, um, let's say that someone got a diagnosis of some disease from some doctor. Well, are you going to have a debate with like, you know, that person and, and maybe the person that is yeah. like checking your brake pads who says that you don't have that disease? It makes no sense. You have like on one hand, a person who's got all of this training, 
all this evidence, who is like a professional in the field talking to other professionals in the field, you know, aware of like the cutting edge yeah. of the research. Then you have like a random person who's saying that's no true, that's not true with like, you know, no credentials and no evidence to back him or herself up. So yeah, it's not it, a debate. <laughs> well, especially if, you know, if you have cancer, you have cancer. It's not like it's uh, debatable. Well, you can certainly get a second opinion, but you wouldn't want to get that from the person who checks your brakes. No, no. Is what I'm saying. But even if you got it from someone else, uh, quite often they would corroborate what the first right. one said because well, there's well, a certain sure. amount of Sure, and that's evidence. exactly the situation we have in, in climate science right now. You know, yeah. if you talk to a hundred climate scientists, and, and it's, again, you know, some of these quote unquote climate scientists might just be like physicists who study something else um, and who claim to be climate scientists. But you know, if you talk to a hundred of them, you might, maybe a thousand of them, you might find one or two who, who claim that, you know, maybe global warming isn't being caused by humans, for example. But the other 999 are gonna tell you that, yeah, it's pretty cut and dried. Yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of debate. So if part of the answer, you know, there's actually some other sort of details as far as um, message. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that facts will um, convince people, and obviously they haven't. No, <laughs> they haven't. Um, but even that notwithstanding, how do you think you can help other scientists, uh, not just with the article, but help other scientists to, to unite, to build bridges with people outside the scientific community, to use language that's more accessible, and to be, um, yeah. kind of the canary in the coal mine um, so that there is a little bit more urgency. That's right. So when the scientists talk behind, you know, in the journals, in the peer review journals, and they, they're basically talking to each other using this technical jargon, you know, they might say that um, something like, uh, you know, uh, action to mitigate global warming uh, is advised or some, some such language like that. You know, um, and then when the public yeah. hears like kind of dry language, which is hidden in a lot of you know numbers, a lot of methodology, a lot of complicated plots, um, they basically they're like, well, those guys are the ones who are on the front lines. They're looking at this on a day-to-day -day basis. They've got the best view of this, and they don't seem worried to me, right? Because humans, let's face it, we we communicate on a more emotional level, not really on a right. factual level. So so I'm urging climate scientists to kind of break out of that scientific shell and to speak as humans. And so, so I, I'm not afraid to, to embrace the term alarmist. I'm very alarmed by what's going on in the Earth system right now. Yeah. And I really think that we need to do urgent action. And um, you know, business as usual goes on. We, we drive our cars, people fly in planes. I haven't flown in several years and I, I try to reduce my own impact. But you know, all around us, all my neighbors, all of my friends, we're burning fossil fuels like we have been for the last, right. you know, 50 or 60 years. It's been it's been ramping up over time, and so when you see everyone doing that, it's deeply normalizing. So right. um, it's hard to imagine that something's wrong, something's seriously wrong, when everyone you know is burning this stuff, which is supposed to be the cause of the problem, yeah. and then you have politicians and heads of EPA who are saying that you know this isn't true, it's not a problem. So then if you don't want to give up the fossil fuel, and uh, I should say that, you know, I used to burn 20 tons per year, which is about the same as the U.S. average. Mm. And over a period of about four years, I reduced that down to less than two tons per year. Mm -hmm. So a factor of 10 reduction. Yeah. And I don't feel less happy. I don't feel like it's been a sacrifice. Well, you look healthy. You look fine. Yeah, I'm perfectly happy. I don't fly. Like, you know, I actually kind of prefer not getting all the jet lag and the sickness. But for the average citizen, how do you measure that? How do you keep track of that? Because you're, well, you're a scientist, you, yeah. it's probably fairly easy for you to so calculate. So th that's a little complicated. I had another article in a, in a different version of Yes Magazine, mm -hmm. which kind of goes into a great amount of detail of, about how to, how to calculate that. For me, it's kind of fun to do that. It's like sort of a game, and then I can track it year by year and yeah. see it go down. I, I wasn't happy with the calculators that are on the internet because I put in a bunch of numbers and they would spit out another number, but I w wouldn't really know how exactly that connected to my life. So I just sat down with like, you know, electric bill and natural gas bill, estimated how many miles I drive per year. Mm -hmm. I know like how many miles per gallon the car gets. Uh, and then, you know, estimated my flights. It just like looked at those basic things and added to how much I, I emitted in a year. And then there's a little more complicated things like diet and you know, buying stuff, so then body yeah. CO2 and stuff. So it gets a little bit complicated, but 
you're right, I, I kind of like that stuff. But I tried to digest that and then present it in a way that would be as easy as possible for other people. <laughs> yeah, so in that other article, did you give some suggestions on how people could measure their own carbon footprint? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, you know, if you fly this many miles, here's how much you emit. Yeah. And, you know, if you're, you have a regular meat diet versus a vegetarian diet versus a vegan diet, here's much, how much those emit per year. So you basically, you have to gather, you know, maybe seven or eight numbers from your life, like electric bills, like I said, natural gas bills, how much you fly. And then you can just convert that into an estimate of your emissions. And then, you know, then, then it's like, well, okay, how do I bring this awareness to my daily life? You know, everything we do right. pretty much in daily life in this society uh, has some emissions associated with it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you eat, when you go pick up your kids from school, uh, when you buy something on the internet, you know, when you, obviously, when you take a flight, is, for me, that was the biggest thing of, of all, was yeah. giving up flying. And I think that um, for some people, too, there's this notion that it's somewhat elitist to be thinking about um, saving energy or, sa or, you know, like a Prius is more expensive than a, a Corolla. Right. Um, and then to be able to get uh, um, an electric vehicle, there's um, certainly an investment, but then there's, mm -hmm. there's everything from maintenance to the electricity. And yeah, so how, uh, in such a, a carbon dependent society, how do we change um, behaviors to get people <laughs> to be, and especially yeah, if they're- That's the trillion dollar question. If there are <laughs> economics involved too. Yeah, so, so that's, that's a huge question. You know, I reduce my personal emissions because I like to do that, you know, because I'm so aware of global warming and the impacts that it's causing. And I've got two little kids. They're right. eight and 10 years old, you know. So, you know, I'm really concerned about what's happening. And I think about their future and the future of other children. So it doesn't feel good to me to emit anymore. So I reduce it as much as I can. Yeah. I still cook food with natural gas. I haven't figured out a way around that. So there's still a, a few things that I do. You know, I bike as much as I can. I love biking. You know, I often say that if, you know, I had a magic wand and I could make global warming disappear overnight, I keep biking just as much as I do now. Because yeah. a lot of these changes, you know, growing food, uh, biking, for me, not flying, I actually prefer that. Um, I actually per personally prefer being vegetarian. A lot of these changes I actually prefer and I would keep doing uh, mm. even if global warming went away. But I understand that that's what you could call a hard sell and not a lot of people are, are going to make those kinds of changes. I, encourage people to experiment with that because it's actually possibly a lot more fun than people realize. Yeah. But we need collective action too. So, uh, so I've thought a little bit about what policy, actually a lot about what policies could actually help with the situation. Oh, and to help uh, change behavior through legislation? Exactly. So the thing that I think that we really need to pass right now is something called a revenue neutral carbon fee. And um, what that means is you basically have an increasing uh, price on fossil fuels when they come into the country or when they come out of the ground. So it's completely upstream. So anything that you use more fossil fuels, like when you bought that plane ticket, the price of that fossil fuel would be in the plane ticket. It would make the plane ticket more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, bought a more efficient car, you'd be paying less of that price on, on fossil fuels. If you bought you know, a big Hummer or something, you'd be paying more because it would yeah. be in that gallon of gasoline. But then the revenues that were collected from all of that carbon that got sold will get just passed out to the people on, on an equal basis. Yeah. So you know, if you're using less fossil fuels, uh, you'd actually come out ahead because you get this quarterly dividend check. But what if? More than what you were oh, spending. Yeah. Yeah. But what if, let's say, the Hummer was powered by a hydrogen fuel cell or by electricity? Well, so then, you know, however much fossil fuels it took to- To build it? To, well, to build it- And for, then to for, ship it? To build it, to ship it, and then to like pack that hydrogen in the fuel cells, you yeah. know, if that took carbon, if that took fossil fuels to do that, like you had to use electricity to break apart the water yeah. to make the hydrogen, then those fuel cells would be more expensive because, you know, the person making the fuel cells would have to pay for that electricity. If it was 100% solar, then there wouldn't be any extra cost. But yeah. if it was coming from, you know, a coal power station, then it would increase the cost of those fuel cells. That's what I mean by upstream, you know. Right. And the same thing with growing food, you know, if you had like, someone growing food using methods that didn't use a lot of you know, nitrogen fertilizer and right. fossil fuel, mm -hmm. then that would be cheaper relative to a farmer who was using a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. So um, this carbon fee, and sometimes, some people call it a carbon tax, 
And it would be a carbon tax if the government actually kept the money and used it to make high-speed trains or something. But then it would be regressive on people who don't make as much money. Right. So if be. you give it back to the people, then first of all, it's not a tax. It technically isn't a tax. It's a fee because the government's not keeping any of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's much more palatable to conservatives who, who don't want new taxes. Um, and then, you know, the, the people who, who don't have as much income uh, are, are going to, you know, it won't be regressive. And there's actually a really strong correlation between um, how wealthy someone is and how much fossil fuels they burn. So the, the wealthier are going to be paying more into this because they're buying more fossil fuels. Right. And then the poorer people are going to get the same size dividend check. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll probably, you know, I, mean, I think about two thirds of the population, just as it is now, will come out ahead because the, the people on the lower end of the economic spectrum are essentially getting subsidized by the, the rich people. And then if, if people change behavior and stop burning less fossil fuels, then they'll come out even more ahead. Yeah. So it's kind of a no-brainer uh, policy, actually, in my opinion. Well, maybe the policy is a no-brainer, but getting it passed, that's, uh, I think that's another um, huge challenge. Well, again, so you know, you could say, like, let's say we had an administration that actually cared about mitigating global warming. Right. You know, there's different ways you could go about doing it. Uh, what you know, the Obama administration was really pushing was uh, was kind of command and control regulation. So they wanted a lot of regulations um, to kind of push everyone away from burning fossil fuels, right. just saying you can't do it. Um, this is using the force of the market. So you know, libertarians and uh, conservatives should be more behind should this. Be. Yeah, because you can replace a lot of those regulations with the fee. I know this is, we're getting into really wonky territory. Yeah. But, well, the other part so. too is that um, it discounts the economic uh, potential profit of some people who are aligned with carbon, and so they aren't going to want to let that go. Very well, actually, it, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, it's kind of like gone through the rabbit hole and come out the other side because the fossil fuel companies now actually are pushing for this kind of a carbon tax or carbon. They don't care whether it's a tax or a fee. They just, what they want is a predictable price on carbon. So the price would rise every year. It would start at a really low level that you wouldn't even notice for a few years. Every year it would get gradually bigger. But this way, the fossil fuel companies have a predictable framework and they can decide what they want to invest in. The problem for, from their point of view with the regulation, it's totally unpredictable. It changes when you get different administrations. Um, there's no way to predict what regulation is going to be in place five yeah. years from now or 10 years from now. But with a, with a price on carbon, it's completely predictable. So they could say, well, if we switch you know, this much of our business to renewables, at this point, we're going to make this much profit versus if we, you know. So they, they can do that kind of calculus with their business. And yeah. they, they know that eventually we're going to do something about global warming. So they'd rather have it be something that's predictable. Phased in, yeah. And the reason I say it kind of went through the rabbit hole and came out the other side is now there's some like big green groups that they're like, oh, wait a second, if the fossil fuel companies actually like this carbon fee, then there must be something wrong with it. So, you know, some of the, the green side might, you know, they, they don't trust the fact that, yeah. that that fossil fuel companies want it, but yeah. it's actually a good thing, in my opinion. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time left, although I wish we did, um, yeah. but I want to go back to some of the urgency. So part of your article talks about um, reefs, coral reefs. And there was a film that came out uh, at the end of yeah. last year, Leonardo DiCaprio and Before the Flood. Yeah. Um, it didn't get a huge amount of play, I don't think, but um, there are a couple of scenes in there that are absolutely startling, especially around the reefs, but also mm -hmm. the Greenland ice sheet and some of the other issues. But um, maybe talk for a second about the urgency or how fast is it really changing? Right, okay. So. There was a paper that had a big impact on me, uh, which was uh, 2013. It was a nature paper by um, a professor at the University of Hawaii named uh, Camilo Mora. And so you've got like around 30 or so Earth system models. And you run these things and you, you know, they, they try to simulate um, sort of ocean dynamics and atmospheric dynamics. And they even starting to simulate like how the biosphere responds to uh, like the soil and the, and the carbon system, you know, forests and soil how they might respond to a warming world, how the ice sheets might respond. Right. So a huge amount of work has gone into these models. Um, and you can let them run, and you can see how the planet is warming from, say, now until 2100. Um, and you know, 
the big question mark is how much is humanity going to emit? So to, you know, we have different scenarios where like business as usual, we don't do any reductions. And then there's a re reduced scenario where we like make modest reductions. And then there's a scenario where we, where we make really strong reductions. Mm -hmm. And you can run the models under these different scenarios and, you know, and see how hot the planet will be at a particular time in the future. And um, <laughs> it's, see, this is what I mean about communicating this stuff to the public. It's, it gets really co a little bit complicated pretty fast. Very. But so. let's just say, so, so this will help people understand the difference between climate and weather. So you can say here in Pasadena, you can look at the average temperature for a year, like in 1850, and then in 1900, and then in 1950. Every year, you're going to get a different number. So if you, if you have time on this axis, and you have temperature on this axis, you can plot it, and it's going to be noisy. All right? And then some, sometime around 1950, you start seeing a climate signal coming out. And you see this noisy thing start to go up and start to go up higher. right? But it's still noisy. It's going up and down. So you can compare the future predictions, that, that noisy future prediction, to what happened historically between, say, 1850 and 1950. Um, and you can, you can give, with a given model, you can say, what year after what year is the coldest year that we get going to be hotter than the hottest year we had before global warming? And so, you know, because you got this noisy thing, but you look at the, that historical period from 1850 to 1950, and there's a hottest year, right? So it's, this is the coldest part. You get this noisy thing. This is the hottest part. Eventually, you get, you know, a years that are bumping up yeah. above the hottest year. They might dip down a little bit, but yeah. eventually, they're never going to dip down again. And so Mora named that uh, climate departure. Yeah. And then he did that for There's, lots of models, took the average, and made a global estimate of when that would happen. Uh, when, when the planet as a whole, that, that, so all these different locations, when the average of those different locations would have departed, and it would be a different climate. And it's sometime around 2040 or 2050, but it depends on how much yeah. we reduce. So yeah, it's just well, a few decades away. I want to. Thank you for being here today. Like I said, there's so much to, to talk about yeah, it's and hard several to... other um, topics that I wanted to cover, but um, maybe we can continue this another time. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah, and thanks. you're doing really good work, and I wish you the best on your book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, thanks, and um, keep up the good work. Thanks.